Happy Saturday, everyone. Recently on the show, we talked about Princess Charlotte of Belgium, also known as Carlotta of Mexico. Previous hosts, Sarah and Dublina, did an episode on her husband, Maximilian, back on November 14th of 2011. That older episode doesn't really talk much about Charlotte, and our new episode doesn't spend nearly as much time on why Maximilian was sent to Mexico or what happened after he got there. So, for folks who would like those parts of the story, we are sharing this classic episode today. Enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah Dowdy. And I'm Dublina Chakravorty. And we talk about royalty a lot on the podcast. It's really one of my favorite subjects to cover. And consequently, because we talk about it so often, some subgenres have developed. One of them, royal imposters. You know, we've talked about guys like Lambert Simnel. And false Dimitri. Yeah, another self-proclaimed monarchs like Emperor Norton. And the king of Beaver Island, James Strang. Yeah, or just sad royal childhoods like Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth. There seem to be a lot of those. I know. Almost every other royalty episode is a sad royal childhood. But one of my favorite of these royal subgenres, though, is the puppet ruler. You know, somebody who is important or maybe really charismatic or just well-connected, maybe just well-born and kind of weak and easy to control, who is ultimately propped up by a more powerful outside force who's really controlling things. And we're going to talk about a famous puppet ruler today, Ferdinand Maximilian, Archduke of Austria by birth, Emperor of Mexico by invitation. And he'll really surprise you. He's naive but good-hearted. He truly believes the people of Mexico want him, an Austrian prince, to rule them, though he's deliberately misled in that respect. And we'll look at that a little bit more later. He takes this opportunity to rule with fatal dedication. Yeah, I think he really will surprise you guys as a as a not so good example of a puppet ruler when it all comes down to it. But we're also going to talk about the antithesis of royalty today, Mexico's national hero Benito Juarez, who was a self-made man who rose to the presidency, you know, got his own education and successfully defended his country from an allied European invasion, you know, pretty serious stuff. But that these two men, a Habsburg prince and uh, the orphaned son of Zapotec Indians, should ever be in conflict together in Mexico is just pretty bizarre when you think about it. But that they had remarkably similar plans for what they wanted to do with Mexico, plans for the people of Mexico, is just downright strange. So we're going to talk about both of them. We're going to talk about many, many countries and many rulers in this episode. It really has something for everyone. It does. But first, we're going to start out with Maximilian. Ferdinand Maximilian Joseph was born in Vienna, July 6th, 1832, and his full title was Prince Imperial and Archduke of Austria, Prince Royal of Hungary and Bohemia. That sounds pretty fancy, like a lot of power, but those were really just his younger son titles. Maximilian's older brother, you see, was the future emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary. So the younger Maximilian, who was intelligent, needed some sort of occupation in life. And so those were the titles that he got. At 22, he became rear admiral of the Austrian Navy and worked to modernize it. And at 25, he took up the position of governor general of the Lombardo-Venetian kingdom, which was under Austrian control at the time. And he also got married. He married the beautiful and charming 17-year-old Princess Charlotte of Belgium, who was the daughter of King Leopold I. We mentioned him in our Victoria and Albert episode. He's kind of young Victoria's male mentor, her uncle. Um, But Maximilian might have been really too bent on modernization when it came to his job in Italy. His brother considered his policies there just too liberal and ended up removing him from power. So when Maximilian lost the job, he decided to take a little time off, go on a trip. And he journeyed all the way to Brazil, which really kicked off a new world fascination, kind of an obsession even with Maximilian. So speaking of the New World, at the same time Maximilian was governing in Italy and traveling to Brazil, Mexico was in the middle of a civil war, La Reforma, a liberal movement with the goal of curbing the power of the aristocracy and the church. 
The movement's eventual leader was a man named Benito Juarez, a Zapotec Indian who had been born in 1806. He didn't seem like a likely candidate for the eventual president of Mexico. He was orphaned at the age of three, and he didn't even speak Spanish until he left his hometown and studied in Oaxaca. He was smart, though, and while at first his intelligence made him a likely candidate for the priesthood, he was soon studying law. His first public office was on the municipal council, and he became a member of both the state and national legislatures, judge, and eventually governor of Oaxaca, making him a notable public figure in the state. But he got into trouble by being so notable, because when the conservative party of Mexico returned to power in the elections of 1853, Juarez was exiled into the United States, and he lived in New Orleans in really... uh, almost semi-poverty, I've seen it described, for two years before his party took back control and he was appointed Minister of Justice and Public Instruction for the new administration. The new reform government started to make some really, really big changes in Mexico. And these changes were, of course, supported by Juarez as a, as a minister. And just to give you a sense of what was going on, um, the government abolished the special courts for the clergy and the military. It broke up landed estates in this attempt to sort of create a middle class from scratch in Mexico. And it forced the church to sell its property, though don't think of it quite like Henry VIII style because they didn't actually start confiscating property. And then it also increased the educational opportunities available to the poor, something that Juarez especially was really interested in, and you can understand why from his own background. And most importantly, the government created a new constitution in 1857. So basically, they were in the process of transforming Mexico into a modern nation state. But in 1858, the conservatives revolted, and Juarez was forced to withdraw from Veracruz, where he created his own government in exile. And that began a three-year-long War of the Reform, which started before Juarez could finally return to power in 1861, where he was voted president. He inherits a lot of problems, though. After three years of war, Mexico is deep in debt. So on July 17, 1861, President Juarez supports a movement passed by the Mexican Congress and suspends payment of all foreign debts for two years. So this is not okay with the European countries who are owed money from Mexico. But what are they going to do about it? Well, some Mexican conservatives were living in exile abroad, and one of them, José Manuel Hidalgo y Esnaurizar, suggests to Empress Eugenie, the Spanish wife of the French emperor Napoleon III, that perhaps Juarez could be driven from power by a new European-backed monarchy. Mm, Sounds like a bold plan, doesn't it? It is. It's one also that would be a win-win for Mexican conservatives and France, since, for one thing, Juarez would be gone. Also, France would get her money back, and both would get control of the new monarch. Yeah, so they both have something they can get out of it. And as a further incentive, though, for Napoleon III, installing his own ruler, his own puppet ruler in Mexico, would potentially prevent the country from falling under U.S. control, which was something that France was very uncomfortable with. So on October 31st, 1861, France, Britain, and Spain, three of the big countries that had money due to them, agreed to stage a joint attack on Mexico to recoup their debts. There's another player, though, that is really kind of more notable for being out of the game than in it. And I just think this is so interesting. But since the 1820s, the U.S. had tried to prevent European influence in the Americas with the Monroe Doctrine, Uh, just for folks who don't know, basically a policy that viewed any European efforts to colonize the Americas as a sign of aggression to the United States itself. So normally, Napoleon III wouldn't have wanted to test the Monroe Doctrine and by extension, test the United States. But since the American Civil War had really just started, Napoleon figured correctly that the U.S. had bigger problems to deal with than a French invasion of Mexico. Still, Napoleon III knew better than to attempt to install someone related to him. Instead, he offers the crown to the available, eligible Habsburg Prince Maximilian. 
So it gives Maximilian something to think about here, something to consider. Then on January 8, 1862, more than 10,000 Allied troops arrive in Veracruz, though the British and Spanish soon pull out of the scheme. Yeah, you can't imagine that they would be very keen on the idea of a French-controlled ruler being installed in Mexico. Yeah, and Juarez isn't happy about it either. He makes his opposition to this European scheme quite clear. He declares that any foreigner who makes an armed invasion without the declaration of war will be put to death as will any Mexican who assists a foreign invasion. And that's an important law or proclamation to remember, actually, for this episode. Yeah, so just keep it in the back of your head. Keep it in mind. There are some really difficult early battles for the French, though, with this invasion. On May 5th, 1862, the French are trounced at Puebla, which is a victory still marked today by Cinco de Mayo. Next time you go out for Cinco de Mayo, you can... Tell all your friends that you know it is not Mexican Independence Day. You know the story behind it. Yeah, that's what people mean when they're like, that's not what Cinco de Mayo is about. It's now not you Mexican know. Independence Day. Now it, you know what you're drinking margaritas for. Victory at Puebla. So reports of that defeat, though, get back to Paris and really kick off mass disapproval of Napoleon III's project. I mean, that they were going to war over these debts and trying to install a king. Another big defeat happens April 30th, 1863 at the Battle of Cameroon, where only three of Captain Jean d'Anjou's legionnaires survive. And d'Anjou's own wooden hand, this is just like a weird kind of freaky side note, d'Anjou's own wooden hand is recovered from the scene of the battle and turned into the symbol of the foreign legion because the French soldiers had fought so bravely, even though they were really overwhelmed. It sounds like maybe things aren't going to work out for the French, but by May 31st, 1863, they do get the upper hand, and Juarez and his army have to flee to the city of San Luis Potosi, which is in the north of Mexico, and basically just continue a series of retreats all the way to El Paso del Norte, which is later renamed Ciudad Juarez. He and his followers, called Republicans or Juaristas, continued to fight. But then back at the capital, a new conservative government is established and a formal invite goes out to Maximilian. He accepts under two conditions. One is that the French will protect him, and the other is that he has the approval of the majority of the Mexican people. So poor Maximilian, he's misled in both of these respects. Really, only a small percentage of the royalists want the Austrian prince to rule, and Napoleon is already beginning to regret his decision. Just a few months after offering the crown, but before Maximilian actually moved, Napoleon writes to a friend, quote, I realize that I have gotten myself into a tight corner, but the affair has to be liquidated. So yeah, that's disconcerting for sure, but still, Maximilian is really upbeat about his new role. He and Charlotte, who changes her name to Carlota, arrive in Mexico May 27th, 1864, and he's there fully believing that he does have the support of the Mexican people, not just this little group of royalists. But both of them take their new job pretty seriously, too. Carlota learned Spanish and began studying Mexican history and art and culture and is reported to have developed a pretty deep love and respect for it, too. While Maximilian, surprise, surprise, started by upholding most of Juarez's reform. So he, again, doesn't seem like he's acting like a puppet ruler at all. He sees himself as a protector of Mexico's indigenous people. And unfortunately for Maximilian, that line of thinking, his real sense of responsibility toward Mexico and his desire to do the right thing for his people didn't help him out much at all. He made no friends with his policies. The conservatives were disappointed that they had basically imported a foreign Juarez, and the church was angry that he refused to restore their lands and instead upheld Juarez's reforms. And though Maximilian's policies were markedly similar to those of Juarez, the liberals hated him for having toppled their legitimate government. Well, and he's just this random Austrian dude. Right. So to add to this, Maximilian basically had to personally finance his own government. France took all the customs revenue to pay back that pre-war debt, so everything came from Maximilian's own inheritance. Which really makes it seem that France wasn't going into this in good faith. I mean, 
I know Napoleon had Napoleon the Third had multiple motives, but if his primary motive was to get the money back at the expense of the government he had set up, you have to wonder what his intentions really were all along. And meanwhile, it's not like the fighting's over either. Maximilian has to get further help from his brother in Austria and his father-in-law in Belgium. And the U.S., even though the Civil War is ongoing, is still a factor. Lincoln didn't openly complain about the violation of the Monroe Doctrine because there was too much fear on his part of creating an alliance between the French and the Confederates. And meanwhile, Maximilian refused the services of Confederate troops who had moved into Mexico for fear he'd anger Lincoln to the point of war. Lincoln's support, however, was already with Juarez. The two wrote to each other, and the U.S. provided him with some assistance even during the Civil War. After the war ended, more than 50,000 U.S. soldiers approached the border and transferred arms and weapons to the Juaristas. By June 29, 1865, even the idealistic Maximilian could see the writing on the wall. He could see what was about to happen here. He wrote, quote, It must be said openly that our military situation is very bad. The American Civil War has ended and threat of war with the United States looms. So Napoleon III sees the writing on the wall, too, though. On January 15th, 1866, he informs Maximilian that he's going to withdraw French troops from Mexico, and he doesn't even wait for a reply before he publicly announces that intention. So when Carlota figures out what's going on and realizes that France is pulling out, she heads off to Europe to try to rally support around her husband. She begs Napoleon III to reconsider. She asks Pope Pius IX to help. And when it becomes clear that no one can really do anything for Maximilian, she has a mental breakdown and she suffers from the effects of that for the rest of her life. So Maximilian, meanwhile, he still believes that he has the support of the Mexicans, and he won't abdicate since he feels like he'll be abandoning them if he does so. So his backers make him supreme commander of the Imperial Army, and on February 5, 1867, he leaves Mexico City for Queretaro, where he's met by his generals Miramon and Mejia. They await Juarez's advancing army there. Queretaro falls May 15, 1867, and Maximilian is arrested. His living conditions are harsh. There's no cot, and there are these ironic reading choices, like the history of King Charles I of England. Which I'd have to say it would be depressing to read about a king who had lost his throne and his head while you were in prison. Indeed. And then on June 13th, Maximilian and his generals go to trial where they're charged under the old Juarez degree of 1862, that one that we mentioned to you guys earlier and asked you to remember. That's coming into play now. And so they're court-martialed and condemned to death. And on June 19th, they're executed by firing squad outside of Queretaro. Miramon and Mejia are shot in the back as traitors, and Maximilian is shot head on. And Maximilian goes down pretty memorably. His supposed last words are, Viva Mexico, Viva la Independencia. So Juarez's decision to execute Maximilian is really pretty unpopular abroad. Men like Victor Hugo and Giuseppe Garibaldi, who is another former podcast subject, uh, had even petitioned Juarez to spare the Archduke's life. But because Juarez wanted to set an example for would-be invaders coming into his country, and because so many Mexicans had died in the war, Juarez decided not to spare Maximilian, obviously. By July July 1st, though, news of the death had gotten back to Paris right as Napoleon III was about to open the prize-giving ceremony of the Paris World's Fair, so really bad timing for him. And as detailed accounts started coming out, some people's anger at Napoleon III is really rekindled. You know, why did he get into this in the first place? And uh, especially because Maximilian is a pretty sympathetic figure. One of the people who is disturbed at France's involvement in this whole thing is Edouard Manet, who decides to go against his own dislike of painting what he hadn't seen. You know, he, he believes artists should paint from life. He decides to go against that principle and recreate the execution of Maximilian, because, of course, he had not been there himself. But he doesn't go about it like the heroic, historic picture kind of style. He uses really detailed news reports, and they're all of these very strange. You can you can look them up actually on MoMA's website because they had an exhibit of some of Manet's paintings of this. You can 
check out these little cut and paste postcards people were really into making of the time, taking pictures of uh, just soldiers in this case, the wall where Maximilian was executed, and then pasting on heads, like pasting on Maximilian's real head or Mejia's real head. And uh, so Manet had all of this kind of stuff to look at. And he did a series of paintings that due to their controversial subject matter were never exhibited in Paris during his lifetime. But we want to give you sort of some closure on our other subjects we've covered in this podcast too, especially Juarez, because his later history really surprised me. I knew him as a Mexican national hero, and I figured since he was an older man at this time, he probably had um, sort of a heroic end of life. But even though he was reelected president of Mexico, political mistakes late in his career made him really extremely unpopular at his death. Yeah, he died in 1872 and didn't become the celebrated hero that he is today until the 20th century when it became clear that his reforms had helped modernize the country. Carlota, or Charlotte, lived until 1927, and she never really recovered from her paranoia and mental illness. She spent the rest of her life in castles in Belgium and in Italy, and Maximilian's older brother, Franz Joseph, reigned as emperor until 1916. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.